Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to give it a couple of minutes to fill the room here. Good afternoon again, everyone. We'll just give it another minute to fill the room. Afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it about 30 more seconds to fill the room up. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on curative therapies for sickle cell disease. My name is Brett Spitali and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will pose to our presenters after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, February 12th, in the events section of NHF or hemophilia.org. I'd like to introduce our panelists today, Dr. Erica Esrick of Boston Children's Hospital, Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and Beverly Francis Gibson of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. Thank you both for taking the time to join us today, Eric and Beverly. And now I'll turn it over to you, Erica, to get us started. Great. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with the National Hemophilia Foundation and especially to present together with Beverly Francis Gibson of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. Um, so sickle cell disease is a massive global health burden. Um, it's one of the most common genetic disorders worldwide. About a thousand babies are born with sickle cell disease in the US every year and um, nearly 300,000 worldwide. At my own hospital, Boston Children's Hospital, we have approximately 320 patients living with sickle cell disease. Next slide, please. Um, for those who are less familiar with the clinical side of sickle cell disease, I wanted to highlight some of its many severe clinical manifestations. And to do this, I thought I would take this one slide to briefly introduce you to four of the many patients with whom I've discussed our clinical trial. Um, AA is one of my own patients who I met when he was a few weeks old. Um, he's already suffered from multiple episodes of life-threatening splenic sequestration, requir requiring surgical resection of his spleen, as well as multiple episodes of acute chest syndrome, which is pneumonia. H is a junior in high school who has been admitted over 20 times to the hospital. Her sister, who also has sickle cell, was actually able to have an allogeneic bone marrow transplant from her brother but her brother was not a match for both sisters. The MRI image um, shows a severe bacterial infection of her spine that kept her out of school for weeks. Um, GW is a 20 year old college student. She had a prior stroke that fortunately had little residual impact, but her risk for another stroke is higher. So she's on a transfusion regimen. And MG is a 13 year old girl who is an avid dancer, but unfortunately has very frequent pain crises landing her in the hospital, which has limited her dancing. She's very eager to sign up for clinical trials because she wants a relief from her pain. Next slide. So briefly, sickle cell disease results from a single amino acid substitution in the beta globin gene. Um, deoxygenation in the blood results in a conformational change that allows bonds to form between the sickle beta globins. And this results in the formation of polymerized fibers. Um, next slide. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and that polymerization um, within the red blood cells leads to distortion of the cell shape, damage to the red cell membrane, abnormal permeability, and irreversible sickling. These then lead to the ultimate pathophysiologic basis of sickle cell disease, which is infarction and anemia, 
Um, the details in the figure on the right are, are written in very small, but they simply highlight the fact that nearly every part of the body can suffer the effects of sickle cell disease. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the treatment options for sickle cell disease, um, I'll just briefly summarize in big picture here. So first to note that in early childhood, it's very difficult to predict future disease severity, which can make decision-making very challenging for patients and families. Um, the medical management of, of sickle cell disease historically has um, been represented only by hydroxyurea and chronic transfusion regimens for certain um, conditions. Um, you know, I wrote here new compounds in development. Of course, now we now have uh, three more FDA approved agents for sickle cell disease, Vaxelator, crizinlizumab, and L-glutamine. Um, only in the last two years or so, um, which is an exciting development, but of course, none of these represent a cure. Um, matched sibling bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant is um, the established um, standard of care curative option for sickle cell disease, but unfortunately less than 20% of sickle cell disease patients have a matched sibling, and the intensive chemotherapy preparation um, is, is intensive and um, results in 85 to 90% event-free survival. However, there is a significant risk of graft versus host disease. Um, so these, this sets the stage for cell-based therapies um, with, or looking for other alternatives. These include unrelated donor stem cell transplant, which of course still um, does include a significant risk of chronic graft versus host disease, haploidentical transplant or half match, um, which expands the donor pool considerably, but unfortunately still does come along with a risk of graft failure and gene therapy or autologous genetic therapies for sickle cell disease, which I'll talk about today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is just a simple schema showing allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, just simply showing that the recipient or the patient um, receives uh, preparation, usually with chemotherapy, and then another individual, a healthy donor, sometimes a sibling, um, donates bone marrow, um, and then um, the recipient receives it. Um, if you click again, there's words to the right. Um, just kind of click through things. Um, so the benefits, of course, that this is a potential for cure, but the challenges, as I mentioned, include finding a donor, the intensive process, and risks include those associated with myeloablative conditioning or chemotherapy, including risk of infection, um, infertility, uh, risk of transplant rejection, and graft versus host disease. Next slide. Um, so this simplified picture illustrates the basic concept of autologous genetic therapy. Um, instead of requiring a separate donor, blood stem cells are collected from the patient, him or herself. And then these cells are modified using either genome editing techniques represented by that scissors or a viral vector. The corrected cells are then reinfused into the patient. The benefits of this approach compared to allogeneic bone marrow transplant are that the patient is his or her own donor and so there's no chance of graft versus host disease. Um, if you click like two or three more times, please. Um, so we don't need to find a donor. There's no graft versus host disease. However, um, one more click. <laughs> um, there is um, also, of course, with any novel therapy, new risks and um, insertional mutagenesis is the concept of the genetic material that's inserting um, actually causing a risk of cancer, which was seen in earlier generations of gene therapy and other off-target effects, perhaps some that we don't even know to look for yet with such a novel therapy. Next slide, please. Um, so what is gene editing? Just at the most basic level, gene editing is using molecular tools to make breaks in the genome. Um, so this allows editing in the form of deletions, so um, chopping out a section of, of, of the genetic sequence, um, or removal of DNA and replacement with a desired sequence of DNA called a repair template. And there are a number of different techniques that are used to accomplish gene editing. Zinc finger nucleases, meganucleases, talon, and CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR is the one that many people have heard about the most uh, recently, but it's just one of several gene editing techniques. Next slide. Um, in comparison, gene therapy usually refers to where a viral vector is used to transfer genetic material into the cell. And this could include in vivo gene therapy in which genetic material can remain in the cell but is not added to the cell's genome, such as in hem hemophilia gene therapy. 
or ex vivo, which is genetic material, can be integrated into the genome. And this is what's used in gene therapy for sickle cell disease. Um, if you go to the next slide, I just want to highlight the difference between the hemophilia type of gene therapy and hemoglobinopathy. So um, in uh, hemophilia gene therapy, the gene we want added is of course the factor eight or factor nine gene. In this figure, the factor nine gene is packaged into a vector made from a virus called adenovirus. Um, it's not yet inside any kind of human cell at this point. The AAV vector is then injected directly into the patient's bloodstream where it then travels to the liver. Um, within the liver cells on the top right, the virus inserts the gene into the nucleus of the cell so that the patient's own liver cell can begin reading that gene and making it into um, factor IX protein. Um, the DNA that was inserted does not integrate into the patient's other chromosomes. And since the transduction occurs inside the body, um, this is called in vivo gene therapy. And then in contrast on the next slide, um, for sickle cell disease, um, instead of liver cells, the target cells are hematopoietic stem cells or HSCs. Um, also, I sometimes call them blood stem cells. So those cells first need to be removed from the patient, and then the cells are mixed together with the viral vector um, where the transduction occurs. Um, this time, the vector is made from a type of virus called lentivirus, um, of which HIV is uh, an example. And so components of the HIV virus are is typically what's used to form the lentiviral vector um, casing for the gene that we want to um, transfer. In the lab, the HSCs from the patient take up the gene that we're aiming to add, and then these become the modified HSCs. And the modified HSCs are then infused into the patient where they travel to the bone marrow to um, set up shock. Um, since the transduction occurs outside the body, this is ex vivo gene therapy. Next slide, please. Um, so each gene therapy trial uses a different genetic payload. Um, and so in sickle cell disease, any successful gene therapy um, will need to have a type, some type of genetic payload that will provide an alternative to the abnormal sickle beta gene. Next slide. Um, this table, um, oh, sorry. So this um, illustrates actually just um, with, um, with pictures here, the different categories of gene therapy that could be used for beta um, hemoglobinopathy. So this is a red cell. This illustrates the beta globin gene. Um, one possibility could be um, correction. So remove the abnormal gene, replace it with a new one. Um, one possibility could be, if we skip down to here, gene addition, leave the diseased gene in there, but just add a normal one um, to produce a normal beta globin gene or in the middle here, fetal hemoglobin induction. Let's make a healthier kind of hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin. Um, and there are several different ways that are being studied to, to induce fetal hemoglobin. I listed here some of the locations and sites um, around the country and world that are using these different strategies in gene therapy right now. Um, next slide, please. Um, so these uh, papers just show the early um, reporting of gene addition approaches. So that um, the one on the bottom where you add a gene um, in 2017 and 2018 began to be reported in, um, in publications for some, with some early success. On the next slide, um, I list um, the currently active gene therapy, lentiviral gene therapy trials um, in sickle cell disease. So the first trial listed is sponsored by a company called Aerovent Sciences, which uses a vector that contains a modified gamma globin gene. Um, I, I included here the um, NCT number, and just as an aside, you know, the best place to kind of find the most current up-to-date list of existing trials is on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, the sites that are um, listed are, you know, continuously updated there um, where these trials are open. Um, and the patient ages for which these trials are currently listed are, are shown here. Um, the second trial, um, which I'll mention in a bit more detail on later slides, is sponsored by a company called Bluebird Bio and uses a lentiviral vector that has a modified anti-sickling beta globin as the genetic payload. Um, this trial has treated patients in a number of different centers in their phase one, two trial, and they now have a phase three trial open in a number of different centers. The third trial out of UCLA is also using a modified anti-sickling beta globin as the genetic payload. The fourth trial is another gene addition trial using a modified beta globin um, as the, in, or located in Paris. The fifth trial is, is our trial at Boston Children's Hospital um, where I'm the clinical PI and David Williams is the sponsor. And I'll discuss a little bit more about our trial in future slides. 
Um, and finally, a trial um, is open at City of Hope, um, which also uses a modified gamma globin gene. Next slide, please. So let's briefly discuss the, um, the HGB206 trial of lentiglobin, which is the Bluebird trial. So the figures on this slide um, were provided courtesy of colleagues at Bluebird Bio from um, a, a presentation actually last year. Um, and uh, so if you remember the genetic payload in this trial is a modified beta globin gene that prevents sickling called hemoglobin A T87Q. Um, the figure on the left illustrates the benefit of T87Q. So beta S, which is the mutated sickle version of the beta globin gene can link together with other beta S proteins causing polymerization of sickle hemoglobin, which leads to all the problems as I mentioned in sickle cell disease. But the modified version um, T87Q actually blocks that polymerization. Um, on the right, the graph shows concentrations of total hemoglobin and T87Q over time after gene therapy. So across the bottom, um, the, if you look at the end values, you can see the number of patients assessed so far. This is not actually as up to date as they've now reported, um, but uh, for each of the, of the post gene therapy time points. And uh, as you can see, the median total hemoglobin shown in blue is maintained above 10 grams per deciliter, so nearly normal. And the level of hemoglobin A, T87Q, um, shown in red, are stable, ranging from 45 to 65% or so of the total hemoglobin after six months of um, post-gene therapy. Next slide. Um, this is additional data from that lentiglobin group um, depicting the number of clinical events defined as vasoocclusive crises or acute chest syndrome episodes before and after gene therapy. Um, each horizontal bar represents a single patient, and the nine patients represented here are the patients who had four or more events in the two years preceding um, gene therapy. Um, so as you can see in this group of patients, the number of events in the two years before gene therapy ranged from four to 28. And after gene therapy, only one patient um, had one event. And that event was a non-serious vaso-occlusive crisis. Um, so uh, no, no acute chest syndrome episodes or serious VOCs occurred in any of these patients um, as of the time of, of this presentation, um, which was up to about 20 months of follow-up. And again, they've now had longer follow-up from this. Um, next slide. Um, so back to the schema, um, that, was gene, that was a brief summary of a couple of the options for gene addition. Um, and I'm now going to turn to discussing the um, approach of uh, fetal hemoglobin induction. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, a little background first on fetal hemoglobin. So um, this is called the beta globin switch and just illustrates the fact that across the bottom you have um, weeks in terms of pre-birth um, and post-birth weeks. Um, and then each of these lines represents a different type of hemoglobin. So um, pink here shows normal adult hemoglobin, um, which, is, which is produced actually at very low levels in a fetus and at birth, and then comes up to um, nearly 100% by the age of about um, one year old. And in contrast, fetal hemoglobin is produced at very high levels in fetus in a young baby, and then gradually declines to nearly 0% over the course of the first couple of years of life. Um, and it's uh, the beta globin, of course, that's the problem in sickle cell disease. So uh, newborns of sickle cell are essentially asymptomatic because they still make a whole lot of healthy fetal hemoglobin and they don't make a, a, much of their um, mutated beta globin yet. Um, so next slide, please. Um, some people with sickle cell disease naturally make relatively high levels of fetal hemoglobin. And over decades of research and observation, we've seen that high levels of fetal hemoglobin um, typically make sickle cell disease less severe. So these graphs from natural history studies demonstrate that. On the left, you can see that rising fetal hemoglobin is correlated with decreasing frequency of pain. And in the middle, um, uh, different in all different age groups, rising fetal hemoglobin is associated with decreasing rates of acute chest syndrome. And on the right, patients with fetal hemoglobin levels greater than about 9% in this study had substantially longer life expectancy. So for decades, doctors and scientists have been trying to find ways to increase fetal hemoglobin in sickle cell disease patients. Hydroxyurea works well to do this in many patients, but not in everyone. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we've long known that high levels of fetal hemoglobin make sickle cell less severe. Um, some examples are there actually, something called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin or good, good responders to hydroxyurea. It's also important to note that pancellular distribution of fetal hemoglobin 
is the best for preventing sickling, which means that as shown in those um, pictures down at the bottom, um, it's much better to have some fetal hemoglobin in a lot of your cells than to have a lot of fetal hemoglobin only in a few cells, um, because the goal is to protect as many cells as possible from the sickling. Um, so we'd like to um, develop a lot of F cells or cells that produce fetal hemoglobin. Um, in, this, in the past decade, um, VJ Sankaran and Stu Orkin, who are pictured there, um, who are colleagues at Boston Children, have dis discovered um, a protein called BCL11A um, to be a really important regulator of fetal hemoglobin and thus a potential therapeutic target. So if you click one more time, you can see um, BCL11A is a protein that normally comes, gets turned on as a baby becomes a little bit older and BCL11A turns off fetal hemoglobin. So if we could find a way to, um, to decrease BCL11A, fetal hemoglobin could be allowed to be produced. So on the next slide, um, the, this image here compares blood smears actually in mice. On the left is a normal mouse. In the middle is a sickle cell mouse model. So you can see the sickled red blood cells there. And on the right is a sickle cell mouse in which knockout of BCL11A has corrected the sickle phenotype. So our goal in our gene therapy trial is to translate this finding into a therapy for sickle cell disease patients by using RNA interference, um, if you click one more time, I think, um, to knock down BCL11A and induce expression um, of gamma globin. So of note, this is a distinct strategy from the gene addition approach um, where, where a new beta globin gene is added. Um, what we're doing is adding regulatory instructions to the cell to block the repression of fetal hemoglobin. Um, Click again, please, and one more time. Um, so a potential advantage of this is that it harnesses this natural um, physiologic switch, switch machinery um, to allow increasing fetal hemoglobin and decreasing sickle hemoglobin. Um, and next, please. Um, so this slide just shows that in terms of a light switch. But our goal is basically flip off the bcl of an a which allows turning up the fetal hemoglobin. Um, and so in our trial, the genetic payload is this um, genetic instruction um, to block BCL11A using a, a construct called an shRNA. And by adding that BCL11A blocking instruction to the vector, um, that's then the um, genetic material that's added to the patient. Um, next slide, please. So to achieve this goal, um, David Williams, uh, and along with colleagues such as Christian Brendel, who are shown there, um, developed a lentiviral vector containing a short hairpin RNA that targets and knocks down BCL11A. Um, important features of this vector include um, the use of the promoter and regulatory sequences from the beta globin locus um, and a novel structure in which the BCL11A targeting region, which is shown in red there, um, is embedded within what's called an endogenous microRNA scaffold, which is the blue part. Um, and we're, we're calling this structure a schmear vector. So this schmear construct allows delivery of a more physiologic genetic payload and allows regulated erythroid specific in, um, expression. So we only want to express this in the red blood cells, not in the rest of the um, tissues in the body. Um, so this allow, allows avoiding the toxicity that would occur if we knock down BCL11A in other cell types. Next slide. Um, so the study events, um, are, this, is, uh, this is the actual clinical trial pilot and feasibility study of hematopoietic stem cell gene transfer for sickle cell disease. Um, and it's a single center pilot and feasibility study. Uh, we are enrolling 10 total patients um, in descending age cohorts, starting with adults and then moving down to younger patients. Inclusion criteria are similar to those used in many transplant trials for sickle cell. Um, so patients um, cannot have a matched sibling donor available and must have a severe clinical phenotype um, and must have tried but failed hydroxyurea to um, improve that clinical phenotype. Our, our trial is um, funded by the NIH and the vector itself is produced by Bluebird Bio in um, collaboration. Uh, next, next slide. So this, is, um, this just depicts the study event and what the patient actually goes through step by step. So starting at the bottom left, and um, if you click through, I have like boxes, sorry. Um, so in pre-gene therapy, the patient undergoes screening tests and stops their hydroxyurea if they're taking it um, and begins at least three months of transfusions before the um, blood stem cells are collected. 
the blood stem cells are then collected through peripheral stem cell mobilization using plerixifor as a stem cell mobilizing agent. And for the patient, that requires a three or four day hospital admission in, in our protocol. Um, then the patient gets to go home um, and wait and the uh, CD34 cells or the blood stem cells are taken off to the lab where they undergo the selection, transduction and cryopreservation. Um, once the product is ready, then the patient comes back to the hospital and um, is admitted to the uh, transplant service and begins chemotherapy conditioning with four days of busulfan as the chemotherapy agent. And finally, the gene modified cells are infused. Um, the patient is then followed on this clinical trial for two years, um, looking at levels of fetal hemoglobin and, of course, any symptoms um, and any adverse events. And then um, uh, uh, follows on a long-term follow-up protocol for uh, many more years. Next slide. Um, so this slide just, just shows a, a person receiving an infusion of autologous gene-modified cells. And I just show this to emphasize that the treatment itself almost feels anticlimactic. It's a short IV infusion that takes about 30 minutes. Um, so patients and families are sometimes surprised to learn there's, there's no surgery involved in this type of transplant. Um, this, is, this is the extent of it. <laughs> um, after a lot of hard work by the patient in getting there. Um, and so I'm just gonna go through some of the data from our pilot trial um, at this point. So um, this is a list of our enrolled patients um, at, at this point. Our, our patients range in age from seven um, to uh, um, 26 at the time of their treatment. Um, genotype in most patients is hemoglobin SS. Um, hemoglobin S beta zero thal in one patient. Um, our patients have a combination of different clinical um, backgrounds, including vasoocclusive crises, acute chest syndrome, and some patients with a history of stroke. Um, some of our patients were on chronic transfusion regimen, and um, follow-up is between um, uh, about, actually, uh, about one and 29 months at this point. Next, next slide. Um, I just highlight, sorry, I just highlight that one patient um, to mention that that's the one patient who um, uh, continued to receive blood transfusions after treatment due to an increased risk of stroke based on his underlying moya moya. Um, this slide illustrates um, safety data for our patients. Um, so in neutrophil and platelet engraftment um, is important to, to track after uh, myeloablation and our patients engrafted in the kind of expected time course after an autologous transplant. Um, the adverse events um, were mostly quite uh, standard after myeloblative conditioning, including um, uh, cytopenias, of course, um, mucositis. Um, and in one patient, we had an unexpected development of type 1 diabetes, who was our youngest patient. Um, in reviewing that patient's um, antibodies that the endocrine team looks at, it appears that that patient uh, likely had a genetic predisposition to diabetes that was um, uncovered by the um, intensive chemotherapy and um, uh, transplant course. Um, importantly, before infusion, the only uh, grade three or higher AEs were um, related to central venous catheters. Um, there were no grade three or more adverse events associated um, related to the mobilization or the collection procedures and um, none that were ultimately associated with the medicinal product or the gene therapy itself. Um, next slide. Um, so this graph illustrates what's called vector copy number, which is the number of um, the average number of vector copies per cell um, if for each patient, um, each of our first six patients. Um, we um, reported our first six patients um, in, a, in a recent publication. And um, after six months um, post gene therapy, the number of vector copy number has remained quite stable, um, which is encouraging to see. Um, next slide. Um, this illustrates the fetal hemoglobin in, the, in our first six patients who had over six months of follow-up. Um, so across the bottom is the months of since infusion of the, of the vector. And then um, on the y-axis is fetal hemoglobin represented as fetal hemoglobin divided by fetal plus sickle. So at the beginning, there's some hemoglobin A from transfusions present. So that's why it's presented in that ratio. And what you see is that um, our patients are settling out at fetal hemoglobins between 20 and 50% um, of the total hemoglobin um, compared to the baseline down at the bottom left there. Um, this 
illustrates what's called F cells. So if you um, remember back to where I presented um, that we would like the fetal hemoglobin to be broadly distributed across the cells, um, our patients have about between um, 60 and 90% of, um, of the cells are producing fetal hemoglobin, um, which is encouraging to see that the fetal hemoglobin is in fact broadly distributed and protecting a higher proportion of cells from sickling. Um, next slide, please. Um, this illustrates um, hemoglobin on the top. So total hemoglobin um, in most of our patients is uh, between about 10 and 12 um, grams per deciliter. Um, one patient um, has a slightly lower hemoglobin, but um, started off at a much lower baseline. The baseline over on the y-axis um, is influenced by the fact that several of these patients were on transfusions before gene therapy. Um, and then the bottom two graphs on the left are absolute reticulocyte count and on the right LDH as markers of hemolysis. And you can see that although um, the retic count and the LDH um, are lower than you would see in an untreated sickle cell patient, they still are um, not normal. And so we, we definitely do see continuation of some hemolysis in our patients after gene therapy, which is not surprising given that although maybe three quarters, two thirds or three quarters of the cells are F cells, the others are still producing quite a lot of sickle, hemo sickle hemoglobin. So there is a residual hemolysis going on. Um, so overall, our patients um, have had no VOE pain after gene therapy, um, no respiratory or neurologic events, and no transfusions except as planned in subjects, um, in one of the subjects. Um, these were of the patients who um, we reported um, in, uh, in the public report last month. Um, one of our patients did continue to have priapism. Um, it's improved, but it has recurred intermittently. And I think this is important as an example of the fact that um, damage that's done to tissue um, before gene therapy, especially in an adult who has um, you know, suffered with sickle cell disease their whole life is not necessarily reversible through autologous genetic therapies um, as is the case with transplant as well. Um, next, please. And um, so in conclusion for, for our trial, um, CCL11A is an effective molecular target in sickle cell disease patients, which is important, which is an important demonstration to show that targeting BC11A um, leads to effective fetal hemoglobin induction and broadly distributed fetal hemoglobin. And that at this point, the Schmier vector is safe at the current um, follow-up time point. Next slide. Um, so for, for this project, our next steps are to um, complete the pilot study enrollment. And um, just of note, hundreds of patients have expressed interest, which really speaks to the unmet need in sickle cell disease in general, and for the enthusiasm for new treatments, um, ours and the others that are out there. Um, we're planning to look at some additional endpoints to try to better understand what the most important um, features are to look at in patients post-treatment. And um, we're beginning to plan a multi-institution phase two trial through the bone marrow transplant clinical trials network, which will hopefully be opening within a few months. Um, next slide. Um, so um, it's important to think about broadly about safety. So in our trial, but in all the other lentiviral gene therapy trials, so far, the most adverse events have been consistent with myeloblative conditioning, as I mentioned. But it's very important to note that there has already been a case of a patient with myelodysplastic syndrome and AML in one sickle cell patient that developed after gene therapy. Um, this is a known potential risk of useful fan conditioning, um, but it's one that's very important to um, you know, discuss with patients considering this treatment. Um, and so far, the collection um, process has been well tolerated. Um, central lines do come with some risk. Um, there have not been any reported evidence of clonal dominance or insertional mutagenesis um, associated, such as occurred in earlier um, generations of gene therapy, and no um, what's called vector-mediated replication um, competent lentivirus, um, and fortunately no graft failures um, associated with, the, with lentiviral gene therapy. Next slide. I just, um, the last um, thing I wanted to focus on is just um, to, to point out that that top right uh, says in development, um, there, there are now uh, trials being developed looking at the actual correction of the sickle cell mutation itself, which is an exciting um, new prospect. Um, and next, 
Um, so finally, I wanted to emphasize gene editing as the other current alternatives. Um, right now, uh, the uh, most common approach looked at for gene editing is targeting what's called the BCL11A erythroid enhancer. Um, those are areas of the genome that reside next to the BCL11A gene, um, and um, by, by blocking them, basically uh, block BCL11A expression solely within the erythroid lineage, which is the goal. Um, and so next, next slide. Um, these are the currently active gene editing trials that are, that are open and listed in clinicaltrials.gov at this point. Um, there are three um, that are sponsored by Novartis, um, Vertex and CRISPR Therapeutics and Sanofi BioVeritas. Um, the, the second trial is the, is the only trial that has reported um, any results yet on um, the next um, slide, I have a, a figure from their recent paper um, in the New England Journal. Um, and on the left, this just illustrates the, uh, the strategy that's being used, which is to use the CRISPR-Cas9 um, method of gene editing to um, target the BCL11A erythroid enhancer that I just mentioned. And the, the graph on the right here shows the first sickle cell patient um, that they treated, um, illustrating months after the infusion of their product, which is called CPX001. Um, and in the, in the green is hemoglobin A from the transfusions um, during the uh, transplant process. In the purple is hemoglobin S and in the blue is fetal hemoglobin. So similar really to the range that we're seeing in, in our trial, um, pa this patient um, is achieving um, a, a substantial induction of fetal hemoglobin um, after the uh, gene editing, which is very encouraging. Um, next slide. So um, it, all of these strategies, um, I think, are still um, at play. One of the most important questions I get from families who are interested in learning more about gene therapy is, which of these is going to be the best? And that, of course, is an unanswered question, um, and one that I think is extremely important to think about. You know, I think we'll hopefully have time for discussion a little bit about um, what families and patients who are um, looking into these treatment options should be thinking about. And, um, you know, if families don't ask me that question, then I propose it <laughs> um, and say, you know, families often will ask, uh, why pick one trial over another? Um, and similarly, is it important to get this treatment now or, should we wait for five years when there may be more data about if there's a benefit to one of these approaches over the other? And that's one of the most important questions, I think, for families to consider when they're looking into treatments like this. Um, next slide, please. And, and also weighing the balance between allogeneic transplant and autologous genetic therapies. So um, in uh, allogeneic transplant, you have the risk of immunosuppression, of immune-mediated rejection of GVHD, which we do not see in gene therapy, but alternatively in gene therapy, there's a potential risk of oncogenesis or off-target activity. Um, next slide. Um, and lastly, um, I, I just put this here to highlight a couple of um, uh, um, things that I think about a lot, which is, all the media attention that these trials um, have generated. Um, I think it's exciting in the sense that it's raising awareness about sickle cell, but it also um, comes with some challenges and risks about um, the messages that uh, patients and families get um, so early in a brand new um, type of treatment. And the bottom is just a, a snapshot of an article that's looking at um, attitudes toward gene editing among stakeholders within the sickle cell disease community, patients, families, and um, providers. And I think this is extremely important to look at as we um, delve into this new world of therapies. Next slide. Um, these are just many of the people who I work with here at Boston Children's and Collaborators. Um, it's a huge team and I, um, of course, our studies would never uh, happen without the huge team. And of course, the patients in our study and the sickle cell community. Um, without whom we could never have these new treatments. Um, that's the end of my part. So um, thank you. And I'll hand it over to Beverly. Thank you, Erica. Um, that was really informative. And I actually learned a lot. So thank you for the detail and um, particularly the information about the BCH uh, 
clinical trial that um, you're undergoing at your institution. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am happy to join you as well and to share some information from the pers patient perspective. Um, I'm the president of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. We are a national organization focused on assisting, supporting, advocating for patients and their families with sickle cell conditions. You can go to the next slide. We do that through a number of member and community-based organizations throughout the country. And we're also very interested in um, the search for a universal cure for sickle cell disease. I think when that day comes, many of us will breathe a sigh of relief. And I know a lot of the patients would be so happy and their families would be so happy. Next slide. Um, so I am not going to go over what sickle cell disease is because I believe that Erica did a very good job of explaining that um, and what the complications associated with sickle cell disease are. What I will say is that we are focused on the fact that there are approximately 100,000 Americans living with sickle cell disease in the United States. Next slide. The burden, as Erica mentioned, is um, heavy in this country. And I, every day, talk to and um, communicate with and are part of patients' lives who are impacted by this disease. Um, I will tell you, over the holidays, we lost a number of young adults to sickle cell disease. And it is actually pretty tragic when someone in their 30s um, cannot live the life that they had hoped to have. Um, so I, I am hoping that with all of the work that Erica's team, Boston Children's and all the other groups are doing, that there will be a cure and that we will see that soon. Next slide. Um, as Erica mentioned, we now have four drugs on the market that were approved by the FDA. Um, hydroxyurea obviously is the one that many of our patients um, have been taking and know about. And uh, we know that um, hydroxyurea is partially effective in preventing stroke and may not have um, major effects in terms of development of um, culinary hypertension and other things. So I will tell you that there are patients who are also very hesitant about taking some of the new therapies that are on the market, um, or the new drugs that is that are on the market, and many of them have questioned whether or not they should. Um, we of course encourage, and encourage is the word I would use, patients to talk to their providers to find out what is best for them and for their families. Next slide. Um, so we know that scientists, as Erica has demonstrated, have long been involved with and curious about how we can impact sickle cell disease using um, gene therapy. As opposed to other diseases, sickle cell disease has you know, the one errant gene and it ranks pretty high on the list of diseases that could potentially be cured. Next slide. So far, the only way to treat or cure sickle cell disease is through bone marrow or stem cell transplant. Transplants from a matched sibling is very safe, but unfortunately the chances of having a sibling match is about 25%. And as Erica shared with her slides, the risk and the complications also make it tricky for patients to participate. We know that transplants have reached about 2000 individuals worldwide with an overall survival rate of 95%. Um, and an average age of 10. So it makes it tricky for people who are interested, um, next slide, in participating in um, gene therapy to be a part of it. Um, I wanted to share with you some of the things that um, we talk about in the sickle cell space. So gene therapy, as Erica mentioned, modifies the person's gene to treat or cure the disease. Patients with sickle cell disease obviously wanna know more about gene therapy. There's a lot of curiosity. But I will tell you when um, the 60 Minutes presentation happened, um, there was an eruption in the sickle cell community because what the patients heard was that we would be getting um, you know, the um, AIDS virus. Um, they, that's all they heard. And they didn't fully understand anything about the vector or how that worked. And so I think there has to be a lot more efforts to explain in layman's terms to patients what exactly is going on. Um, so we know that there isn't a lot of information that's widespread, but there is a lot of effort on the way to change that. Uh, we know that patients are excited at the prospect of having improved health 
um, and quality of life. And as Erica demonstrated when she shared her slides, there are a number of patients who are excited to be a part of her next study. But we also know that patients are skeptical. Patients who don't know a lot and don't have a lot of information tend to err on the side of doubt. And so we are really pushing to encourage organizations um, to get information out and data out to patients and patient families. One of the issues that constantly is talked about in the patient community is well, whether or not organ damage can be reversed. And I think Erica also spoke to this in her slide. And I will share with you in the African-American community, there's, you know, historically there is distrust and mistrust of research due to some of these, the studies that were done, um, unfortunately, not in the best interest of families. And so next slide, there is a lot of hesitation, but it's at the same time, that's coupled with a lot of excitement. So Stephanie um, was curled up in her hospital bed waiting for a bag of stem cells from her bone marrow that were modified by gene therapy. The hope was that the treatment would cure her of sickle cell disease and that, would ca that, that caused um, excruciating pain, organ damage, and early death. So we know scientists have been experimenting with gene therapy would make success. If Stephanie's procedure is successful, more testing can begin for other sickle cell disease patients. Next slide. So this is what the patients wanted to know. How soon will Stephanie and other sickle cell disease patients know if her procedure was successful? What is the cost of gene therapy? Patients speculate that it is expensive, but they're not quite sure of the actual cost. How do researchers and scientists build trust with patients who don't want to be treated as guinea pigs? And this goes back to what I mentioned previously about the, um, the history um, in the African-American communities. Some patients don't believe that there will be a cure in their lifetimes. Patients want to be involved in the process from the beginning to the end, and they wanna know what the results are. So many patients say, you know, I participated or I've been asked to participate, but I don't really know what happened once the clinical trial ended. And that unfortunately does not help when we wanna recruit more patients to get involved. Next slide. Scientists around the world are already using powerful new CRISPR gene therapy techniques, um, as Erica mentioned. Um, but like other therapies we know, and we say this over and over and over, more information and more data is needed. Next slide. Some of the headlines that we've seen over several decades now. Gene editing is so easy to do. We couldn't stop it if we wanted to or DNA editing before birth could one day massively expand lifespans. We are on the cusp of gene editing revolution, but are we ready for it? Gene editing humans has great potential, but caution is needed. Gene editing is criticized for ethical safety and religious reasons. And we're already, Nelly, read, are we ready to use CRISPR to change DNA? inside of our own bodies to treat many disorders. And from what we know, this is already happening with Alzheimer's, hepatitis B, muscular dystrophy, and sickle cell disease. Next. I wanted to share with you that in the African-American community, because of health disparities, there is a lot of hesitation um, for families and for individuals who you know, would consider doing this if they knew that it would be minimal, the risk would be minimized. So I wanted to, I always want to um, highlight that the um, economic and social um, circumstances that African-Americans face in our country makes it a little difficult sometimes for them to raise their hands and, and say, I want to be a part of something that could be re revolutionary. Next slide. And this is a question that I hear in the faith community. So are scientists playing God? Are they in control of what happens to our bodies and our lives? And that is a question that I think scientists and researchers should consider as they approach new communities to be a part of clinical trials. Next slide. And again, ethics, that is paramount. And I think many of the organizations that Erica cited in her slide, I work with many of the pharmaceutical companies and they have very strong ethics and they wanna work collaboratively to ensure that there is trust, accountability, and mutual respect among researchers. This is very important to the patient community. And I think as more and more information is shared, I think it does help increase that 
um, that distrust that, that, pa that patients have. Next slide. So in, in, in terms of advocacy, what can we do? We definitely wanna raise awareness um, for the public and for the providers about the racial and ethnic disparities that happen in healthcare. We know that disparities plus systematic racism does impact health. And we want to look at expanded health insurance coverage for families that are interested in exploring these new therapies. We want to ensure that there is, and we advocate for technology resources for families and expand healthcare access, particularly um, with telemedicine and telehealth. We want to improve the capacity and the number of providers in underserved communities. And this is an issue that we're facing, I think, across many rare disease, rare, rare diseases. It's just not um, in the sickle cell space. Next slide. Um, so in summary, I wanted to share that researchers have to develop patient-focused practices that build trust with the sickle cell disease patient and the, the community. Um, most research facilities are all white institutions. So how do they include cultural diversity as part of their daily practice? They have to be transparent with patients because it is important that they know and understand what is involved. Education is key. The more patients know and understand, the more they can be engaged and recruited to be involved. And I think it's important also for researchers to take time to learn and acknowledge the history of science in the African-American community and strive to do better. I wanted to share with you that in um, October of last year, in partnership with Bluebird Bio, um, SCDAA, the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America, we unveiled, launched a gene therapy education center, and it lives on the One SCD Voice website. It is comprehensive and it was intended to assist patients um, to understand exactly what gene therapy is. So I would encourage your um, participants to look at that site. It's onescdvoice.com and look at the Gene Therapy Education Center that we unveiled in October of 2020. And I will pause for questions. Great, thanks so much, Erica. Thanks so much, Beverly. Um, we do have some questions that came in and uh, the first one I think both of you might be able to tackle. Um, what are the best questions patients can ask their healthcare providers when wanting to know if one of these trials or new treatments will be right for them? What do you always want to make sure your patients think about before moving forward? I will tell you that we, we were talking to some young adults who, who are sickle cell patients last year and there was a young man who said that even if it was offered, he would decline it. And I was curious about his response. And he said, because I have lived with sickle cell disease for 28 years, I know what to expect, but I don't know what to expect um, with, this, with the new therapies. And so we encourage um, patients to ask questions. And as Erica was saying a few minutes ago, find out about all of the therapies that are available, find out what the pros and cons are, find out what the impact could be on not only the patient, but their families and their caregivers. How much time will they have to take off work? How is this gonna impact their energy level or their day-to-day -day, um, going, to, you know, doing things that they do every day? Um, but I think those are some of the considerations that should be part of the questions that they provide to their providers. Yeah, I, I totally agree um, with those and also on a kind of practical level, if you're if people are considering looking into um, trials like this, gathering medical records or sort of you know assembling your own history and yes. working together with um, with the patient's own primary hematologist is also really important um, because it's it's way easier for research teams to partner you know with uh, with the hematologist who's are also already on board. So like the the Big, you know, so the more team approach, the better um, for a patient, their family, their own hematologist and the research study team. Yeah. Great, thank you. Next question comes in and Len, you might want to weigh in on this one, sir. Um, when learning, uh, when learning, can those in the community, in, in the bleeding disorders community take, or I'm sorry, what learns can those in the bleeding disorders community take from these clinical trials in sickle cell? Well, I think the, the first thing is, um, really thinking about what the possibilities are. 
And I think the, the, the sickle cell disease community and the research that, that's been done um, for, you know, in search of a curative treatment for sickle cell disease really, I think, is um, something that the hemophilia community can ascribe to and can look forward to uh, potentially in the future. Uh, you know, the, the, this technology has been used to cure hemophilia in mice. Uh, so, you know, that's, those are the early stages of research. But I think that the possibility of gene editing for hemophilia, you know, exists. There's currently one clinical trial that I'm aware of that is looking at um, uh, gene editing in hemophilia B. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I think this is, this is in our, foref in, in our future and on the forefront. And that's why I wanted to bring this type of uh, presentation today by leaders in the sickle cell disease community to the hemophilia community. I, I would also add that I think that um, you know the message that I that I mentioned before about um, thinking about all the different options um, and thinking about when is the right time to make a decision of picking is something that um, folks may not think of. You know, I, on, on the one hand, new trials are extremely exciting and encouraging, um, and the different people have such different levels of sort of enthusiasm for being the first versus fear of being the first. And I think kind mm -hmm. of having that open discussion um, is very important um, to try to understand that about um, yourself if you're the patient or and for the um, physician to understand about their patient too. Yeah, I would, I would tell you, we had a, a sickle cell patient. Um, I think he was one of the first and he agreed to participate in the trial and never told his wife. Um, <laughs> or his children, that he was going to be undergoing this, you know, very, very excruciating process, long process. And um, he admitted that in hindsight, he, he, he should have um, <laughs> told his family, told his wife specifically, that he was going to be embarking on this, um, this journey. Um, and she, we did a panel with both of them uh, a few years ago, and she told me that she was livid at the same time that she was excited. She was livid that he did not think that she should be a part of the, the conversations um, early on. That's probably just a good life lesson in general there, Beverly, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Next question. Yeah. Next question. Um, Eric, we'll start with you. Um, one of the challenges with hemophilia in vivo gene therapy is duration of how long the levels of factor will remain stable over time. Is that an issue with ex vivo gene therapy that sickle cell is using? Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the main questions that we are all asking in these trials is durability. Um, and, you know, so far so good in terms of the durability, but all of these trials are still relatively, relatively young. Although some of the Bluebird trials now, you know, have patients that were treated nearly a decade ago. And so um, overall, um, the durability has been really promising. Um, and I think similar, I just saw my colleague, who many of you may know, Stacey Croto at Boston Children's, who's our hemophilia expert, um, just did an internal presentation to us about hemophilia gene therapy. And it looks promising um, from what I could tell as well in the, in the hemophilia um, ex vivo setting, I mean, in vivo setting as well. Um, but durability is a big part of the question being asked. In these Erica, can, you, can you comment a little bit on sort of the durability that's been observed in clinical trials, for example, in immune deficiencies? Um, yeah, so um, again, um, very promising overall durability for the integrated money viral vectors. Um, I haven't heard about, um, you know, concern with uh, loss of, of effect. Great. Um, next question comes in. There are so many different approaches to gene therapy for sickle cell. Do you anticipate that all methods that prove to be successful will be valuable and brought to market due to different challenges in the population? Um, it's a very good question. Um, so whether the kind of they would all sort of side by side progress versus, um, I think we don't know. Um, that keeps being my answer, but um, you know, still yeah. early early days. But um, 
there's the possibility that one of these will end up being sort of the runaway <laughs> favorite, I guess. But uh, as of right now, I think um, the, the more the better in terms of promising approaches because we're already not reaching anywhere close to the number of people who um, you know, are interested in, in therapies. Um, so you know, a lot of the questions about the ultimate insurance coverage of these treatments, um, how we can be equitable about um, who ends up having access to these treatments, I think is a, is a super important question um, that the, the field will have to wrestle with. Um, but I don't know about kind of how many will end up being um, out there. Great. Um, if I can keep you keep you for just maybe a couple minutes, is that okay? Do you, do you Erica, sure. remember the time? Great. Sure. Um, other question that came in is, um, what is the age range for gene therapy treatments? Also, is there any concern for women versus men to receive gene therapy? Um, that's a good question. So age-wise, um, in sickle cell disease, I believe the youngest patient who's received gene therapy is um, seven. Mm -hmm. um, gene therapy in general, there's not a lower limit. I mean, the, the trials, for example, for kids, severe combined immunodeficiency, um, have treated very young infants um, to try to correct their immunodeficiency before they are, have a chance to develop severe infections. Um, and so it's theoretically able to be done. In fact, there are studies looking at in utero um, cellular therapies for um, some diseases. So there's not like a lower limit based on the technology. Um, the question about um, males versus females, um, there's no difference in terms of anticipating efficacy. Um, one important um, part of gene therapy or transplant in general with the myeloblative conditioning is the risk of infertility. Um, and so for all of our patients, men or women, boys or girls, um, we right away have a, a meeting set up with anyone who's interested with um, our fertility preservation team to talk about the different options. Um, and that those options, of course, vary if we're talking about a prepubertal child compared to um, a postpubertal adult. Um, but the, um, that field is advancing a lot too. So, um, which is very promising um, because that's a, of course major concern for many people and a deal breaker for many people who are, would otherwise consider this treatment. That's true. We have two more questions if you can bear with us. Beverly, we'll start with you on this one. Um, it is, uh, what is your expectation to work together? Um, the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America in order to get education out to patients about gene therapy basics, the areas in research, et cetera. Is there any expectation for recruitment for trials from the association? Yes, well, we encourage it. Uh, we work very closely with the pharmaceutical industry, all of the companies to get information in the hands of the patients and to, with our member organizations um, in a way that they can um, understand it. We also encourage the companies to um, host events, webinars, town halls, meetings, with our patient groups so that they can hear directly from them and they can answer any questions that they have. We do um, share information about upcoming clinical trials with our members, patients, and caregivers. So that is a part of our DNA. Great, great. And then one last question, and this is always a topic of conversation in the inheritable blood disorders community as well. Um, and, and this could be posed to both of you really. Um, you mentioned cure for sickle cell disease. Does gene therapy stop any inheritance of sickle cell disease? And what does cure mean to you? Um, that, so that's a great question. Um, no, so this does not impact um, inheritability because what we're doing is we're collecting hematopoietic stem cells or blood stem cells basically that live in the bone marrow. Um, we're not editing or changing the patient's sperm or egg. Um, and so if, for example, a patient does fertility preservation um, or um, maintains fertility after the treatment, um, they would still be at risk for having a baby with sickle cell disease. Um, and sorry, what was the second? Oh, what does the cure mean? That is also an excellent question that, you know, I would feed to the patients um, primarily, but um, uh, I'm very careful not, not to use the word cure um, because we are still in a trial that doesn't have uh, final results yet um, or, and the durability question. 
Um, but, you know, I think that serious improvement, um, significant improvement in, in symptoms and decrease of risk of complications um, on balance for some people would be, um, you know, enough of a benefit to side with the risks associated, but for some people it may not be. Um, and so I, I think that it's a very individual question about cure. I would, I would agree. And I would tell you that, um, you know, improved quality of life, whatever that means for the individual patient is what we are striving for. Um, no more pain, no more complications, the ability to be able to function, um, it, you know, with their children or at work the way they would like or they would define it, I think is what we would ultimately say would be a cure. In quotes. Yeah, <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> But maybe yeah. I could ask one last question. Beverly, how much work has this has the sickle cell disease community done with patients to define or provide a definition of a cure? Um, well, there's the Cures Initiative, you know, that was announced um, a few years ago, and many of the patients have been involved in roundtable discussions about what that looks like. Um, and I, I will agree with Erica, there are groups that are saying, so let's not use that word at all um, because it may be misleading in terms of what the um, outcome or the expectation could be. But we have been working closely with the patient community to educate as much as we can about what's available. And I think um, to something Erica said a few minutes ago, the more options that are out there, I think would be better because then people can figure out for themselves with their hematologists and their families and their providers what makes sense for them. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you both for uh, Erica and Beverly for taking the time to join us this afternoon. We certainly appreciate your expertise and your time. And I'd also like to thank each one of you for joining us. Uh, please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, February 12th at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our archived webinars. Also um, available in the events tab is our upcoming schedule for our weekly webinar series. Thank you for joining us once again. And again, Beverly and Erica, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.